Vizcaya, a vintage glass of sumptuous wine, decadent and rich, poured out along Florida's Biscayne Bay. Bright, frothy notes sparkle across the senses, a glittering display of wealth, consumption, and finery. Cheekily, she winks from her place on the water. Her open gates beckon, winding through the dense hammock where she reposes, enthroned upon her garden bed. Meandering across her lush acres and into the plush house, her notes begin to change. Rich, golden, and fading, a hint of days gone past, stillness where there once was movement, ropes now funnel her visitors through. Her maker left her, the cellar lies empty, the table never to be set again. She is left, now a hundred-year-old vintage, to be tasted briefly during business hours only, for the world in which and for which she was made is long since over. Hello, hello, welcome to Rachel Paints Poorly. My name is Rachel and I paint poorly. Today, we are journeying to Miami, Florida to visit Kaya Museum and Gardens. When discussing real estate, the three most important words are location, 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 and Vizcaya is no exception. Located on the shore of the Biscayne Bay, Vizcaya's loveliest landscape feature is the sparkling water of the bay. With the hazy coastline of Key Biscayne on the horizon, and her most impressive entry point is from the water. While this seems quite apparent to us today, it was actually rather unusual given the time period in which she was built. The Gilded Age saw rapid industrialization, population growth, and increased urbanization, resulting in an impressive increase in the United States gross national product. Vast family fortunes were made, with names like Rockefeller, Carnegie, and Vanderbilt still known to this day. Americans were now among the richest people in the world, but decidedly lacked the aristocratic pedigrees of their old world counterparts. They made up for this in part by adopting trappings such as horseback riding, yachting, art collecting, and architecture on a grand scale. Not just any art and architecture would do, however. No, the Americans were captivated by a specific time period in European history, the Renaissance. While named after the Spanish province of Vizcaya, Biscayne in English, Vizcaya herself was based on a villa created during the late Italian Renaissance, the Villa Resinico located in Bassano del Grappa and built by architect Baldessere Longhenga. However, the Villa Resinica was located in the mountains. Vizcaya was constructed on Brickell Point, an area on Biscayne Bay north of Coconut Grove. The area consisted of low lion hammock, the local term for the mangrove jungle, near the bay, which rose inland across several hundred feet to an elevated ridge overgrown with hardwood forest. Typically, the house would have been placed on the ridge, with a series of gardens leading down to the waterfront. Placing the house down at the water's edge complicated things considerably, as both the building and the surrounding land would have to be raised several feet to avoid high tide. The owner, however, stood firm, for it was his idea and ultimately his decision. His name was James Deering, and he was one of four unlikely collaborators behind Vizcaya's creation. James Deering was born in 1859 in southern Maine, his father, William Deering, was a successful wool merchant who turned his entrepreneurial sights on an automatic hay baling machine. In 1980, his 3,000 machine gamble had paid off, and he turned to James and his older half-brother Charles for help. James left college, and Charles resigned his commission in the Navy, and the three together founded the Deering Manufacturing Company. In 1902, the Deering Company merged with the rival McCormick Harvesting Machine Company to form the International Harvester Company, for which James Deering was first ranking vice president. Although he continued to be vice president until 1919, around 1908 James ceased active involvement in the company, presumably due to poor health. By this time, however, the International Harvester Company was turning out hefty profits and bonuses, and the Deering family, with original share ownership of over 40 million, had money to burn. On the advice of his doctors, James Deering decided to build a winter home in South Florida, not too far from the modest house his parents wintered in in Coconut Grove. At the time, this area was very much on the outskirts of nowhere, but Deering, when pressed as to why he had chosen it, merely stated that he had been everywhere and that this was the place he felt most comfortable. To oversee the whole shebang, Deering hired former painter and assistant decorator to the highly celebrated New York decorator, Elsie de Wolf, Paul Chalfin. The son of a well-to-do New York City family, Paul Chalfin spent two years at Harvard University before embarking on an artistic career, studying at the Art Students League in New York and the École des Beaux Arts in Paris, 
After returning stateside, he spent a year as a curator for Boston's Museum of Fine Arts before returning again to Europe, this time as the recipient of a painting scholarship given by the Metropolitan Museum and the American Academy in Rome. Fame and fortune as a painter would escape him, however, and his post-scholarship life in New York City consisted of writing art criticism and working for Elsie DeWolf. It was she who sent him to James Deering, being too busy to go herself. Fortunately for Chalfin, he was quickly able to prove his worth by recognizing a recent purchase of antique furniture by Deering was fake, and he persuaded the offending Marshall Field store to take it all back. Recognizing an asset when he found one, James Deering invited the younger Chalfin to accompany him on a trip to Europe over the summer to act as a guide and artistic advisor. It was on this trip that Deering revealed his plan to build the winter home in South Florida. At first, the two discussed basing the house on a Spanish design, but according to Chalfin, quote, we spent one entire winter making plans for various types of Spanish houses. But one night, with his characteristic abruptness and making decisions, Deering swept them all aside and we came to the determination that the building should be of the Italian villa type." End quote. For all his artistic skill, Chalfin was no architect. Deering and Chalfin both agreed on hiring, not a well-known architect with many projects under his belt, but someone young and relatively unknown. Someone who, in the words of Deering's niece Barbara Deering Danielson, quote, would do what Deering and Chalfin wanted him to do." End quote. With James Deering's approval, Chalfin selected just such a man, Francis Burl Hoffman Jr. F. Burl Hoffman Jr., a native to New Orleans by way of a blue blood New York family, was young but already experienced. He attended both Harvard and the École des Beaux Arts, like Chalfin, and graduated from the latter with honors. While still a student at the former, he had built a country house for a friend, in 1909, he opened an office in New York City. His first project was a Woodlawn Cemetery mausoleum located in the Bronx. On his hiring by Chalfin, Hoffman recollected, quote, Mr. Chalfin asked me if I would make plans for his client, Mr. Deering, in such a way that use should be made of the many treasures of antiquity that had been acquired, end quote. He accepted, but soon found himself ultimately serving two masters. James Deering, ever the businessman, was keen on being involved in the minutiae of the drafting process, up to and including the plumbing. Paul Chalfin, on the other hand, was a bit more devious, giving direct orders and expecting his opinion to be given the final say, and also going behind Hoffman's back to accomplish his goals. Complicating this further was the fact that Deering and Chalfin had been working on the plans for the house two years prior to Hoffman's hiring, and they had also gone to Europe to purchase architectural details that they now wished incorporated into the design, ranging from paintings and tapestries to door frames and entire ceilings. Ultimately, Hoffman crafted a hollow square, that is, a square-shaped house with an open courtyard in the middle. Downstairs, the public rooms are laid out in a U-shape, forming a sequence for guests to progress through the house. Loggia, entrance hall, reception room, living room, and dining room. Upstairs, Hoffman arranged Deering's private suite, five guest rooms, each with private bathrooms, and three additional guest rooms in the two towers. A small dining room, as well as the kitchen and the pantry, were also located on the second floor. This unusual choice, kitchens were typically on the first floor, was made to prevent smells from accumulating in the courtyard. The kitchen was part of a service area located in the front of the house, which also contained 14 servants' rooms and the servants' hall. Work on the house began in the spring of 1914, but apart from a general agreement that the garden should be Mediterranean in style, no plans had yet been drawn. By the fall, however, all of that would change, with the arrival of Diego Suarez. Like Hoffman, Diego Suarez was young but had already obtained a certain level of experience. Born in Colombia in 1888 to a Colombian father and Italian mother, Suarez studied engineering until about 1906, when he accompanied his recently widowed mother back to her native Italy. He continued his education in Italy at the Accademia del Belli Arti, studying architecture. His interest soon turned to historic landscape architecture, and he eventually acted as a guide for Deering and Chalfin to visit several private gardens and villas, two of which he had designed, at the suggestion of the American's host, Arthur Acton. In 
In an interview with James T. Maher in 1965, Diego Suarez recounted how he came to work on Vizcaya. Quote, when we were visiting the villas and gardens, Mr. Chalfin told me that Mr. Deering was building a great house in Florida, and he said that if I happened to come to the United States, I should call on him and we could talk about gardens. Shortly after that, Lady Sybil Cutting said to me, we're going to the United States and you're not doing anything here, why don't you join us? It seemed sensible to join Lady Cutting's party. We were hardly on the ocean when we heard that the war had started. After arriving in New York, I ran into Mr. Deering and Chalfin, who asked me to come see him at his office. When Mr. Chalfin asked me if I thought I was capable of designing Mr. Deering's gardens, I knew it was an opportunity to use all the knowledge and experience I had gained in Italy. Chalfin told me that my name would appear with his on the working drawings, but we had no formal agreement and, anyway, I was too young to think much about things like that." End quote. Unfortunately for Diego Suarez, his youthful ignorance of such matters would contribute to his lack of proper credit for the work he did at Vizcaya's gardens. After he left the project in 1917, Paul Chalfin essentially erased his name from the records. This professional pettiness enveloped Burl Hoffman as well, for Chalfin was loath to give either men credit for the skill and effort they poured into Vizcaya. As late as 1954, in an interview for the New York Times, Chalfin stated, quote, Hoffman did the plumbing, I did the house, end quote. Hoffman, now a successful architect who hadn't been on speaking terms with Chalfin for decades, threatened to sue, and the paper was forced to print both a retraction and a correction, in which Diego Suarez was finally given recognition as Vizcaya's garden designer. Before Suarez's arrival, as house architect Hoffman also began preliminary designs for the gardens. In the fall of 1913, he was instructed by Chalfin to focus on the house, as Chalfin intended to take over the designs of the gardens himself. What exactly made up Hoffman's original plans remains unclear, as they have yet to come to light. However, we do know that one of Vizcaya's most distinctive outdoor features appears in Hoffman's first drawing, the great breakwater in the shape of a boat, known as the barge. 175 feet long and 36 feet wide, made of a concrete substructure and clad in stone, the barge was built on a sandbar of dry land out in the bay. Once work was completed, the tidal land was removed, allowing water to fill in the area between the barge and the house. Its exterior is decorated with masks, urns, obelisks, swags, balustrades, and mermaids on each end. We can deduce from letters that Diego Suarez, once he joined the project, contributed to the overall character of the barge, aided by the dictates and fancies of Chalfin. Hoffman created the drawings, and Deering paid the bill, which was increasing, in his opinion, at an alarming rate. Chalfin had hired Alexander Sterling Calder, a sculpture whose resume included a piece in Washington, D.C.'s National Mall, to create the pieces for the barge, at a bargain price, according to Chalfin, of $10,000, on top of the $67,000 already spent on the barge. There was another issue as well. Deering did not much care for the particularly well-endowed female figures with baskets of fruit on their heads Calder had created for the barge, the, quote, archaic saucy bitches, end quote, as Calder referred to them. After some back and forth with Chalfin, Calder agreed to alter his, quote, poor sea girls, end quote, to Mr. Deering's taste. Indeed, Mr. Deering's taste was to make itself known throughout the gardens, most particularly in his desire to maintain the integrity of the native vegetation. He was an early conservationist and took pains to preserve his hammock, vowing to cut no trees, and even had an enormous live oak slated for demolition moved from Miami to his own property. After visiting Vizcaya in early 1915, Suarez reworked his original plan for the gardens to accurately reflect South Florida's weather patterns. According to Suarez, quote, the original plan had a series of terraces and levels gradually descending to a lake at the southern end of the property. Standing in one of the main rooms in the southern section of the house, and looking in the direction of the proposed gardens, the light was so blinding and the glare was so strong that it would have been impossible to see anything without the aid of dark glasses. I immediately saw the necessity of having a high curtain of trees in the distance. This observation gave me the idea of the fan-like plan which we ultimately carried out in our final design. I visualized two long vistas directing the eye as far as the lake, 
leaving between them a higher level of terrace crowned by thick foliage and trees, which would act as a screen against the glare of the southern sun." End quote. The sun wasn't the only obstacle lurking in Biscayne Bay. Topsoil was in short supply, and what existed on the site had a habit of being sandy or silty and high in salt content, when it wasn't being subjected to flooding from the ocean. To combat this, Deering, who was himself interested in tropical horticulture, set out to improve the soil, consulted local experts in native plant life, and also looked to import compatible plants from elsewhere. Royal palms arrived from Cuba in July 1915, oaks came to be planted on top of the mound in May 1916, a list from January 1920 indicating the arrival of a variety of flowering plants includes moonvines, periwinkles, and jasmine. There was one flowering plant they couldn't get quite right, in the unfortunately named Rose Garden. An exasperated Deering wrote to Chalfin, quote, We will have to give up the name of Rose Garden, for as you and I agreed the other day that probably there will be few roses in it, and we will only make the place ridiculous calling it by that name, I do not want scraggy roses in the garden." End quote. By this time, both Burl Hoffman and Diego Suarez had left the project, in 1916 and 1917 respectively. Work on the gardens continued without them, including a remarkable area that is sadly no longer with us, the lagoon. Possibly originating with Deering himself, the lagoon was a maze-like landscape filled with islands, bays, and lagoons. He wanted a portion of the area to remain in its natural state, reminding Chalfin, quote, I have always wished some of the property left wild, to leave part of the south property so that it should resemble the Everglades, end quote. In addition to the wilds, the lagoon contained an oriental garden and six islands in a glittering lagoon, each joined together by six bridges. Swans and ducks floated across the water, sending ripples under the O Bridge toward the casino, perched up on the mound. The casino was the main focal point from the house, and also provided accommodation as a tea house and shelter for guests while out of doors. Other decorative luxuries dotted the grounds as well. Stonework and statuary shone white against dark green verdure, columns and fountains rose above paths and over flower beds, and delicate filigrees of iron arched across entryways and along railings. The same care and attention lavished on the interior of the house was also afforded to Vizcaya's gardens, for they, in the true Italianate style, were designed with an eye for living in them, as extensions of the rooms of the house. Work on the house first began in the fall of 1913, a task complicated by the remote location of the building site. A section of rail was run from Henry Flagler's Florida East Coast Railway to the area, and a long channel and a harbor were dredged for the shipment of building supplies and artwork. At its peak, the total number of workers employed on the house and the garden was around 1,000. They constructed the house out of unreinforced concrete for the walls and reinforced concrete floors on steel I-beams, perfect to counteract South Florida's termites, decay, and hurricanes. By March 1915, the walls were complete, Masons began adding stone trim and plasterers applied the finishing touches while the roof was put into place. As is typical for Renaissance villas, Vizcaya's basement is at ground level, though in her case also above high tide. This is not obvious on the three sides of the house, because the ground level was artificially raised, but on the north side the ground level was left in its original state, allowing the basement to open up into the garden. Here was Darian's sports room, as he coined it, a bowling alley, a billiard room, complete with a concealed bar, to be, quote, opened for the ungodly and closed for the godly, end quote, equipped, and a most remarkable indoor-outdoor swimming pool. Tranquil and cool, with softly tinted walls covered in thousands of shells, the pool's grotto was made to give visitors the feeling of being completely submerged in water. To top off the effect, the ceiling was the handiwork of Robert Winthrop Chandler, who created a mural featuring fanciful sea creatures that seemed to swim overhead around a central area painted to resemble water. A bit of an eccentric, Chandler's enthusiasm for the project was matched by his desire to knock the spots off of a professional rival, who was also slated to do a swimming pool. He agreed to complete $10,000 worth of work for half the price, a small consolation for Mr. Deering, who was surprised that Chalfin had also obtained one of Chandler's famous screens for an additional $5,000.
Upon hearing that his employer had thought it was to be one or the other, Telvin explained that Deering had in fact agreed to both and should write these things down instead of trying to remember them all, to which Deering, quote, more or less cheerfully, end quote, conceded to the veracity of his forgetful nature and accepted the charge for the screen. Paul Chalfin had decided taste for the decoration of Vizcaya. From modern additions like Robert Chandler's screen to European antiquities spanning across centuries. Before a plan for the estate had been drawn, Chalfin and Mr. Deering had already traveled to Europe, where Chalfin's extensive connections with various antique dealers were procuring great treasures that the two Americans simply couldn't do without. Shipments began arriving in New York City from France and Italy to be stored in Chalfin's warehouses until they could be shipped down to Miami. Bills for shipments ran from $600 to $4,000 and more. Despite these high costs, Deering's trust in Chalfin's financial integrity never had an occasion to waver. Routine audits of his books never uncovered anything amiss. Instead, the money flowed freely into Chalfin's vision for Vizcaya. Of his decorating style, he said in an interview for Architectural Review, quote, In my practice of the profession, I have striven to draw houses and interiors throughout myself, but not to draw the furnishings. I have avoided designing and executing furniture, lest the whole, coming from one mentality it should prove too homogeneous to live, should lack humanness and scope, and the good that comes with reconciling the variety and cross-purposes of life at large." End quote. At the time, it was quite popular amongst the uber-rich to decorate the rooms of their homes according to themes. The Georgian room, the Rococo room, and so on. While Chalfin followed this trend to some extent, in his hands the result was much more organic. Less a museum display, which Deering had always resisted anyway, and more a comfortable home that just so happened to be decorated with Italian tapestries from 1550 and a Spanish rug from the 15th century. History is imbued into every nook and cranny of Vizcaya, in some instances after being lifted right out of its original location and transplanted across the Atlantic. One of three antique ceilings at Vizcaya, the mid-18th century ceiling in the reception room was purchased by Deering from the Razi Palace in Venice, where he and Chalfin had seen it in situ. After buying it, they learned that, in its delicate state, it had fallen while being removed and had been dashed to pieces. Deering was prepared to write it off as a loss, but after seven months, Chalfin learned that the Italians had been able to restore it, and did he still want it? He did, and they shipped it over. But alas, upon arrival, the ceiling was discovered to be too small for the room. The Menconi brothers, who had made the working models for Vizcaya up to this point, were miraculously able to craft a way to stretch the ceiling through the use of a matching section that successfully tricked any prying eye. With history also comes a fair amount of mystery, and the reception room has that in spades, in its gold silk walls. Chalfin purchased them in Venice, where he was told that they had been woven by Marie Antoinette's favorite designer, Felipe de la Salle. Their provenance was never given much scrutiny up until the 1950s, when Vizcaya became a museum. By this point, they were suffering from the heat and humidity of South Florida, and had begun peeling away from the walls. A thorough campaign to attempt to find a way to save them turned up fruitless, and portions of the silks began crumbling into dust. One thing the many experts did come up with, however, was that the silks were not the product of Philippe de la Salle. Not only were they more 19th century, but their pattern was unlike any other known fabric from either the 18th or the 19th centuries. Samples sent to the great silk manufacturing centers and collections of the world turned up empty as well. In Venice, textile authority Cesare Bevilacqua was able to trace a portion of their provenance from two private owners to the dealer who sold them to Paul Chalfin, but not its origin nor its unique design. In any event, the silks were actually falling from the walls now, and the struggling museum was unable to come up with the funds for its replacement, which Bevilacqua estimated would cost at least $30,000, and take himself, his wife, and their daughter three years to complete. In an act of charity, Bevilacqua and his wife reproduced the silks at their own expense. Since 1966, the new silks have graced Vizcaya's reception room, while the remaining fragments of the originals are presumably tucked away, protected from further harm, to maybe one day shed light on their creation. While the reproduced silks have preserved the original character of the house, another, later edition has greatly altered it. In a hollow square plan like Vizcaya's, at the center is the court, or patio, as it was called by Chalfin. It was used frequently for entertaining by Mr. Deering, 
whose health prevented many evening engagements and instead typically hosted afternoon luncheons. Paved with coral blocks from a local quarry bordered by a gray-green native moss, the corners were planted with palm trees and lush foliage, and a 16th century fountain added ambiance. The stairs to the second floor are accessed off the court, further cementing the area as an outdoor room. It remained as such until 1986, when the addition of a heavy glass roof transformed the area into an atrium, substantially changing the feel of the house. But, beginning on Christmas Day 1916, when James Deering officially moved in, throughout the remainder of the 19-teens and into the 1920s, the court was open to the South Florida sky. Every year, during the winter season, the tinkling of china and wispy clouds of tobacco smoke wafted through the house, gravel paths crunched underfoot while fountains burbled in the garden, and the water of the Biscayne Bay lapped against the barge in unbroken monotony. And so, Vizcaya went on until a fateful day in September 1925, when she received the news that James Deering had died. His health worsening, Mr. Deering had taken to passing his summers at the mineral springs and spas of Europe. The summer of 1925 was spent in Geneva, where he wrote to a friend that he felt better than he did in Miami. Only a few months later, he fell into a coma and was brought aboard the SS City of Paris to return to Chicago. He died off the coast of Newfoundland at the age of 65. In her 1985 book, The Lives of Vizcaya, Annals of a Great House, Catherine Chapman Harwood, who was urged to write an account of Vizcaya by Everglades heroine and environmentalist icon Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, writes that, quote, It was the suddenness of Deering's death that had stupefied everyone. For the estate itself, a bell had tolled. Nothing worse could have happened. In a very real sense, Vizcaya was widowed." End quote. Vizcaya was left before what would shortly prove to be some very difficult years indeed. First, the hurricane of 1926, one year after Deering's death, ripped across Miami and flooded Vizcaya, gushing water into her half-basement rooms and shattering exposed windows. The thick walls of the house stood fast, but the gardens were left a shambles, with shrubbery ripped out, trees felled, statues and vases blasted to bits, and an old barge was washed up out of the ocean and into the orchid garden. Cleanup was kept at a bare minimum. Resources were tight, and the growing clouds of the depression swirling on the horizon augured more difficulties ahead. After the death of Charles Deering two years after his brother, Vizcaya had been left to James Deering's nieces and nephews, who still used it as a winter house. It had also come into the city limits of Miami, which was pleased to collect the annual $12,000 in taxes a year, while Dade County took $20,000. Vizcaya could no longer be operated the way she was when James Deering was still alive, but the heirs were determined to press on and preserve her intact. In 1933, Chauncey McCormick, husband of Charles Deering's daughter Marion, began looking into the feasibility of opening Vizcaya up to the public. The Miami Chamber of Commerce was on board, but the press reported that there had been a proposal for the city and county themselves to operate Vizcaya in exchange for an admittance fee and a waiving of the $32,000 in yearly taxes. The citizenry swelled an angry uproar, and the president of the Miami Chamber of Commerce was obliged to put forth a letter for publication setting the record straight, in which he revealed that the heirs had not asked for a tax concession, but that it had instead been suggested by himself and that what Vizcaya offered in the long term would more than make up for lost revenue in the present. While the lessening of taxes on the estate didn't materialize, Vizcaya was open to the public for the first time on Saturday, January 27, 1934, at 9.30 in the morning. It wasn't as successful as many would have liked, but it went well enough to merit a second go the following year. This time, however, McCormick had invited Paul Chalfin back to Vizcaya to command the renovations to the house and gardens that McCormick thought necessary. Vizcaya was opened for a second season, but again, public response was muted. Many who did attend treated the grounds like a public park, and vandalism was a common occurrence by those who sought souvenirs. The heirs decided not to reopen Vizcaya for a third season. On November 5, 1945, it was announced that 130 acres of Vizcaya was purchased by the Catholic Archdiocese of Miami. The lagoons, islands, and their little bridges were bulldozed over and under, the royal palms from Cuba were felled, and the working farm that once supplied Vizcaya's pantries and cellars was swept away. Recounted Catherine Chapman Harwood, 
quote, it is said that the heirs wept, end quote. Vizcaya hadn't been entirely lost, not yet. Her heart still remained in the house and formal gardens, and it still beat, though faintly. She was down to less than 50 acres, stuffed with valuable art and architecture, and steeped in history. But what was to become of her? Dade County, up until this point content to let her molder behind her pink walls while collecting her tax dollars, could no longer ignore that she might not remain there forever. Says Harwood, quote, the county realized it could very well lose Vizcaya. This, despite years of inattention, it was not prepared to do. From lethargy, the county sprang into active interest in 1952, establishing its right to operate Vizcaya as the county art museum, end quote. James Deering's nieces, Marion Deering McCormick and Barbara Deering Danielson, who had earlier bought out the other heirs, agreed to give the house and land to Dade County for $1.4 million, with the understanding that the estate would be used as a museum or a park only, for all time. Not included in the transaction were the art, furnishings, antiques, and sculptures, which the two women donated to the county over a period of years, also with a valuation of $1.4 million. Beginning in 1954, Vizcaya was under Dade County's Parks and Recreation Department. Ineligible for taxpayer support, she was obligated to go into the tourism business, a fitting industry for a citizen of Miami, only a stone's throw from South Beach. Her transition was not uncomplicated. There were those who complained, arguing that if her contents were worth anything, they would have been stolen long ago. Parking issues for tourists and privacy concerns for nearby residents cropped up, the slow dribble of $2 a head admission fees prompted the bandied idea that turning her into an amusement park would certainly up attendance numbers. As befits any lady, her defenders quickly moved in, reminding their churlish neighbors that, in the rapidly developing city of Miami, to have such a shining example of the humanities would burnish its once backwater image better than any amusement park ever could. Eventually, Vizcaya would prove her defenders correct. By 1968, she welcomed 200,000 visitors a year. According to the National Trust for Historic Preservation, that number has increased to about 3,200,000 ,000 annually. Today, her visitors are of a different sort. Chattering school children excited to be out of the classroom, dour teenagers dragged along on a family trip, polite sightseers checking a box, lovers of historic homes, thrilled to pass through the hollowed halls but grieved by the constraints necessitated by the museum setting. In a few hours, the doors will close, the footsteps retreat, the voices fall silent. Viz Kyle will once more sit empty, a relic of a time gone by, a dusty jewel in a faded box, glittering on the bay.